Okay, well, here we are. Interesting spot in the history of the Dragons franchise. Um, so it is my ambition to take certain notions that were put in place in the first film, carry them through into the second film, develop them, uh, kind of answer some unanswered questions uh, about Hiccup's life, about the behavior of dragons, and, and then trace those forward into a conclusion that will be uh, mind-blowingly dramatic and huge. So one of the big challenges in meeting Hiccup five years later was to design him as a 20-year-old. And we didn't want Hiccup to suddenly become this strapping, heroic figure, even though he is the hero of our story. So much of his charm lies in how kind of gangly and awkward and, and dorky he is. So it was important for us to, to retain as much of that quality as possible while still making him heroic in his own way. I think the aging them up thing is something that Dean pitched when he pitched his idea for the, the second film. And I think it was something different that you don't see actually in animation. So I think that was kind of a bold choice on his part. Toothless is Hiccup's best friend. This is, you know, not to take away from any of the humans in his life, but he, they, they have a symbiotic relationship. They, they need each other. They're both kind of odd birds, outcasts, um, and they both had some work done. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's no Hiccup without Toothless. So I, I think one of the biggest ambitions was to, to be bold with the relationship of Hiccup and Toothless because that relationship is, is so crucial to the whole trilogy. Oh, come on, Dad, really? It really is the best entry I think a character's ever had in cinema history. Um, you know, masked and mysterious, and you don't know whether she's a, a force of good or a force of evil. Utterly enigmatic, she rises out of the clouds and, um, and as sort of, terrifies and um, bewitches Hiccup. And then he is as surprised, I think, as the audience will be, that in fact, this masked, mysterious, half-dragon person, half-human, um, is in fact his mother. And in the case of the Bewilderbeast, uh, we had this idea that we were going to introduce the top of the chain. this dragon, instead of being um, a fire-breathing, flying dragon, would actually be a water dragon that swallows back masses of water and then regurgitates it with such extreme force that it tears apart its, its subject and freezes it mid-splash, leaving these really iconic arresting images of ice spikes and devastating destruction. We wanted, at the same time, the dragons to feel real and believable and tangible, but we also wanted them to have a sense of humor. Like, we needed to make them entertaining and be communicating something that the audience recognizes that the way, you know, a stand-up comedian caricatures uh, politicians, you know. We wanted to caricature animals or different types of species. For every dragon, we kind of mixed and matched certain types of animal behaviors. For example, the gronkle is a mixture of a bulldog and a helicopter and a bumblebee. So it sounds abstract, but when you actually uh, put this, those, those elements together, you get a flavor of a character, and, uh, and that along with the design, that, that you get a very recognizable piece of animation. In the world of How to Train Your Dragon, the, the world is represented as you know it. So of course, you know, it implies that we had to add a considerable amount of details on those characters, not only details on their outfit, but also work the skin, the eyes, the hair, and uh, make sure that all those would give to the public a sense of credibility, something incredibly believable. So John Powell wrote one of the best scores I've ever heard for Dragon One, and I was so excited to work with him again on this second installment. But he too had the same very daunting challenge of building upon that. And strangely, uh, he managed to do it. I don't know how he did, but I think the, the score for Dragon 2 is the best work he's ever done. Yonzi, who is uh, he's an incredibly talented musician, songwriter, and in particular, he was writing that, that really sort of thematic, wonderful piece that introduces Hiccup flying with Toothless at the beginning of the film. We
to be involved in a movie that means as much as uh, How to Train Your Dragon does to people. Uh, you know, I could retire tomorrow because I was part of it. I'm very, very proud of it, and I think it came together beautifully. It's like such talented teams have worked on this movie, and uh, I'm in such awe of them. Thank you.